Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. It's 2 o'clock, Rock, with uh, Ethan Allen. And he, as you know, is the host of Likeable Science. He invented Likeable Science, <laughs> as the case may be. But today, I'm going to be his host, and he's going to be my guest, because he has something so exciting that he wants to talk about it in the role <laughs> of a guest. <clears throat> and that is a whole thing about gene splicing for m mosquitoes, which is in all the you know, great national, international interest over the Zika virus. All right. So that's why we're going to talk about this, and we're going to drill down into the like. Welcome to your show, Ethan. <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. It's nice to be here. <laughs> I always enjoy sitting in this chair. It's, yeah, it's, me too. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's get to it. Um, you know, it's all the news that we have uh, <clears throat> uh, not one but many uh, mosquitoes around the world that are spreading diseases that we really hadn't heard of before. <clears throat> These diseases like Zika are having really pernicious effect on lots of people. We don't even know how many people, and we don't know exactly where, um, or exactly you know, uh, what, what happens to the population that, I, that, that comes down with this disease, the Zika disease. Um, and so it becomes a real threat in many places and continents. And so uh, people get more interested, as you are and I am for that matter, uh, in what can we do about it? And uh, some smart guys came up with the fact that we have the CRISPR technology right. and we can mm, do some gene splicing on the mosquitoes and the, I guess the DNA in the, in the mosquitoes so that they don't reproduce. And if they don't reproduce, then they can't bite you anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's all true. Uh, so, but, you know, you got to step us through it, okay? Right. Uh, what exactly is the technology we're talking about? So yeah, you, you mentioned earlier it goes by this acronym of CRISPR, or not really more, more formally CRISPR-Cas9, because it's really it's a blend of several technologies. And over the past few years, scientists have really upped their game in this in the ability to, to find a gene in an organism, cut it out, sort of put it into another set of another sort of framework of molecules, stick it back anywhere they want, make as many copies of it as they want, amplify it up if they want, amplify its expression turn it down if they want. They can really do all this now in, in almost a cookbook fashion. I mean, it's a very dead it's simple te technology. So let me step you through some just curiosity questions. Right. You talk about like it's surgery, but how do you do surgery on, on a, a cell in a mosquito? It's pretty small. Uh, and you know, what, so did you find a, you know, one little tiny cell in a mosquito? How, how does that translate into big science? Most, most of this stuff is done on, for instance, a fertilized egg. You get the fertilized egg, and you take that and, and pull out its genes and start manipulating them and stick them back How in. How do you do it with the micro needles? They're, they're micro needles. Yeah, yeah, they're tiny. Okay, a, mo a moment on micro needles. What is that? <laughs> well, they're tiny, tiny, tiny little needles, just like a regular hypodermic syringe, but so small that they are literally, they are. If, if my fist is an egg cell, a single cell from a thing, the micro needle is like your pen. I mean, it, it's much smaller. It can go right through the wall of it. You go into the nucleus. You start pulling out the DNA. Uh, how, how can I, my hand would shake, right? Well, yes, you, I, you, I you've, got, you've got right micro manipulators that, that okay. translate, that comes, well, you don't want this thing to move very far, <laughs> no, <right. laughs> or it goes right through the cell, right? So you're, you're looking at everything through a microscope, Scope, the right. micro needle, right. the cell, and all that. Right? But they, they do a lot of this stuff now with chemical techniques, too. They can, they can dissolve parts of it away and, and pull stuff out that way. There's a lot of seemingly high-level science, but it's really, a lot of it has now been form, formalized and formulated into a very, set of very clear, crisp <laughs> instructions that make it very easy to do this. You said crisp. I did. I was making a small joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you mentioned earlier, though, the, the Zika, and Zika is indeed, I, I don't want to belittle the threat of Zika, but malaria kills millions every year. You know, it just, it, it's been a scourge for, since the dawn of time, and it continues to be a scourge. And there's lots and lots and lots of people who would like but to that's see. A, that's a parasite, right? That's not a virus. Well, but different. if I, but, Right, but it's carried by mosquitoes, so okay. it's, it's the same, same kind of thing. The technique, though, of CRISPR and CRISPR-Cas9 is not limited to mosquitoes or anything. Indeed, it's, it's first, let, let me step back. So all of our genes that we carry, we, carry, we typically carry two copies of them. You've got one copy from your mom, called, called mom, and you've got one copy from your dad, right? You know, egg and sperm, boom. So every gene you have, you've got two copies Dominant of Dominant recessive. Sometimes yeah. dominant, sometimes recessive, sometimes they both get expressed, sometimes yeah. one gets a little more expressed. There's lots of tweaks to it, but, you, but the two copies are not necessarily exactly the same, okay. right? And then you, in turn, pass on only one of those copies to your offspring, right? Because you're either a sperm or an egg cell, depending upon your sex. And but that would be a, a 
the synthesis of the two cells, the two copies you got, right? No, no. You, you, you have every gene you have. You have two copies of it. You have an M version from your mom and a D version from your dad. Okay. And you only pass one of those back on to your exactly the same right, thing. Right. You're more or less exactly the same, unless it happens to have been damaged during your lifetime or something. Okay. But you will pass half your offspring and get your mom's copy, and half will get your dad's and copy. We don't know which one. And no, you don't. That's, you that's, tip, tip, that's we a, don't know. That's magic. Right. That. <laughs> but now, in recent years, scientists have developed a way to first to spot the sequences of DNA that are actually genes. That's all genes really are, sequences of DNA that are instruction books on how to build proteins, basically. T to grab those, cut them out of a chromosome, and manipulate them and stick them back in in any way they want. They've also discovered the things that sit between the genes, which are elements that can, you can think of them as amplifiers or copiers in some cases, whether they either make multiple copies of a gene mm -hmm. or they amplify its effects, right? So what, what you can do, let's just take a, a thing like eye color. So let's say your mom had brown eyes, your dad had blue eyes, you're probably gonna have brown eyes, right? But well, why is, is, the is brown, brown is blue is recessive? Right. Remember that. Yes, exactly. Brown blue is dominant. It's, it's yeah, more okay. dominant, right? More likely that. Right. In well, fact, it's impossible. If you have a brown and a blue uh, parent, in, you're going to get brown. Right. Only, Only time you get blue blues. is when you have two blues. Right. Right. This is back to very high cla school biology. classic Mendelian genetics, yeah, right? Yeah. But now let's just say there's a, a third choice, and I'll just say green eyes. Although it's not really true in this case because it doesn't work. But let's say when you were a single cell. Somebody took this CRISPR technology for you and zapped the gene for green eyes into you. This gene with the CRISPR technology appropriately applied would m multiply many times and be in, in every cell in your body and would be dominant, would be turned up really high, so you would have green eyes. Okay. Can I stop you there? Yeah. Okay. How does it multiply through your body? Again, genes have ways, and that's a pretty complicated. Very half hour way. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but essentially, some genes essentially tell the cell, "Make more of me, make more of me, make more of me," and just keep giving it that signal, and, and the cell keeps cranking up more, and they keep getting slipped into the chromosomes everywhere else. So I, I take my my magic needle, my micro needle. Right. right. I I change like the genes in one in one, one strand of DNA in okay. one. Right. Uh, and and uh, in one cell, in one cell. In the egg cell, fertilized I, egg, right? Instead of, uh, you know, uh, uh, brown eyes and uh, blue eyes, I say, give me red eyes. Right, yeah. Okay, and then I, I put that back into the same Se cell, cell, or maybe right. another cell, yeah, right. a cell from the same body. Right. Uh, and, I, and I add a little message there. I want you to uh, propagate all over the body. Right. I, I want you to put the red, the red... Uh, uh, Eye, gene. The red, yeah, gene into every cell in this, in this organism's well, body. Well, uh, yeah, all of our genes are already in all of our cells, but th this puts it on, on every chromosome, basically. It's, it's on each and every chromosome. So it doesn't matter. If, if I didn't do that, if I didn't right. say, want you to propagate, right. it wouldn't propagate. Right, right. It would right. just be in that one cell. Right. So what's the magic about propagation? That sounds like it's pretty powerful stuff. That, that is, and that's part of the, part of the technique here. That, that so impressive is that it, it allows you to make multiple copies of these genes and stick them in every single chromosome. And this means that now 100% of your offspring would have that red eye gene. Yeah. And because there are multiple copies of it, it's going to be expressed, right? Yeah. So a few years ago, That's very scary. this group... So a ripple effect, and it's immediate, too. You it's, have to it's wait a, another generation. They, cut, they call it high penetrance, because it, it goes throughout a population very quickly. High penetrance, high penitence. <laughs> <laughs> so a few years ago, a group of scientists uh, first working on this had a colony of fruit flies, you know, standard little brown fruit flies, all scientists love because they breed quickly and have lots of interesting <laughs> stuff. But there is a mutation where instead of being brown, they're sort of a bright yellow color. And they took essentially a relatively small number of these yellow flies, basically, and did this CRISPR technology on their yellow gene, basically, and then put them back in with their hundreds of thousands and millions of other flies, regular looking flies in their fruit fly colony. And within a matter of really, I think it was only a few months, Every fly in a colony was yellow. Every single well, fly. Well, look at the generations. Uh, uh, and a fruit fly are relatively short, like a week or two. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so life is short. And, right. And so, and they were propagating. Right. And uh, so, and every time, 100% of so the by, next. So by the third or fourth right. generation right. or the fifth generation. Even a small every, number of yeah. initial seeders basically begin to spread through the population very yeah. quickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So very impressive. Right. Now, 
people say, who cares, right? So you got a bunch of yellow fruit flies. I don't care what color fruit flies are. <coughs> but but <laughs> it could be any gene. Right. So a few years later, these guys, actually, just, just quite recently, uh, Who's these guys? It's, a, it's a lab out of uh, the Imperial College of what, London. What are the names of the guys? Oh, there's quite, quite a list of authors here. Hammond, Galizzi, Cairo. You know, it's got okay, 15 well, authors. That's the yeah. nature of science right. now, isn't it? Yeah, because it, is, it requires a lot of different expertise. They'll fight to go to, to, go to Oslo and pick up their Nobel Prize. <laughs> there we go, exactly. <laughs> so they took uh, this technique, as it's gotten better in recent years. They looked at the, the uh, mosquito Anopheles gambii, which is a mosquito which carries malaria. And they found there's a, there's a gene that, or a gene variant that confers female sterility. It makes all female mosquitoes sterile. They took the Cas, the CRISPR Cas9 technique, yeah. got that gene and started plugging that into a bunch of little embryonic mosquitoes. They made their small population of mosquitoes who carried this and they put them into their mosquito colony. And guess what happened? In, in a couple of generations of mosquitoes, no more mosquitoes. Exactly. They the couldn't reproduce. That the was the that, end of that. Right. The, when the females were born, that, that, that was the end of their line. The males passed on that gene to 100% of their offspring. The females from that generation died out. The males passed 100% on, and so very quickly, it just spread through the whole population. The whole population just crashed. Curious, how do you find the gene that makes a, a female sterile? How do you find that gene? That's, that's a long and sort of complicated process, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't claim to be up on those technologies at all. But you can essentially, if you find, for instance, a sterile female, you, you can sequence her DNA and sequence that of a regular non-sterile female, and in theory find spots where they'll be different. So and this is mapping, it's yeah, mapping. Yeah, it is. If I find every, if you map every single gene on, on the chromosome, all right. Uh, and account for every single one, you're going to find one that, that does this. Right. Or not. Yes, exactly. So, you know, and we, we found, well, it's, it's more complicated. You know, we found a while ago when we did the Human Genome Project that we have about 21,000 genes, which really sort of surprised people. They were expecting we have a whole lot more genes right. than the that. Fruit, the fruit fly probably has more genes. Probably does. Now, <laughs> almost all plants have many more genes than that. There are plants that have 200,000, 300,000 genes. Wow. <laughs> now, actually, the trick is people are playing games to see how few genes you can make an organism. And I think they recently got something with like 417 genes that, that lives and multiplies, basically, with really a tiny number of genes. And they're getting down to, this is what is essential for life, you know? Well, talk about that, but if, if, I, right. if I find a gene that says don't reproduce, you can't, this organism right. cannot reproduce, right. that's, that's a deadly gene in the sense of why would nature you know, right. create a gene that, that, that stops the reproduction of an organism? Right, and indeed, in nature, that gene is never going to get very far, right? Oh, oh I see. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you don't lose the whole population. And the magic here is that if you can introduce it to both sides, of the, you know, mom and pop, both or whatever. I don't know if mosquitoes have moms and yeah, pops. Yeah, they, but if you introduce, they do. Yeah. <laughs> I want. I, I can't imagine. But okay. <laughs> uh, so if you introduce it on both sides of the family, then you've got a hundred percent accuracy that in a couple of generations you know, that mosquito group is gone. Well, it really doesn't matter. I mean, all with this particular one, because it dealt with female sterility, all you have to do is introduce it to the males, because the females, as soon as you put it in them, they're done for. I mean, they're yeah, going to yeah. live their life out, and then they're dead, and yeah, then they're right. never going to reproduce. So, you know, okay. does them does you no good to waste your time putting it into them. So why do scientists do this kind of... Well, because this, this really is a tremendously powerful technique. It is, a, I mean, it really is groundbreaking. It's going to allow us to do genetic manipulation in ways that we've not been able to do it before. But it also brings up really interesting, bigger questions. I feel them. I, they're already <laughs> weighing heavy, and so much so that I think we, we need to take a, a, a break, Ethan. Okay. Well, before we get into the big time. Okay. We're going to get into the big time in a minute. You'll see. We're going we're to find out about the ethical questions, because this is as scary as it gets here in biochemistry. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back with Ethan Allen and me. Aloha, my name is Jeff James, and I'd like to invite you to watch my show, The Military in Hawaii. It'll be shown every Friday at 11 a.m. here on thinktech.com. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. 
Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Bingo. Bingo. We're back with Likeable Science and Ethan Allen getting into the scary part. So let me <laughs> summarize. You know, we got this fabulous new, really groundbreaking technology that, you know, makes you wonder about the meaning of life itself. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's out of science fiction that we can tinker with the, the very building blocks of life, of exactly. cellular structure, of DNA, and, uh, and then we can change it, and we can end it, too. Oh. You know, I mean, Hitler would have been really <laughs> happy to see this one, because if he introduced these genes to living people who might reproduce, at the end of the day, it would be genocide. Mm -hmm. They would not be, they'd be done. And, and by the way, you know, uh, you don't have to be of any race, religion, color, or creed to be part of this subset. Right, right. Everybody. So if you took what you were talking about, ooh, if you took what you were talking about, Ethan, and you, you did my, my genes and reinserted with micro needles mm -hmm. something with, a, you know, the dead end gene, right. okay, then, uh, and you made my whole body just filled with that stuff so there was no chance of uh, avoiding it. Uh, and you didn't tell me, of course. You, didn't tell me. you probably don't tell the mosquitoes, right? right? <laughs> then, then my line is done. My line is oh, done. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, in the in the meantime, before my line well, is done, if I reproduce with anybody else, his or her uh, line is done. I mean, if it, if it's that female sterility gene that we're talking, your your line can continue as long as there are non-infected females, as it were, still around. But that's only going to be a relatively few generations. Right. Because I'll so, ru run into a, a wife, a woman, a Propagation partner, I like that term, right. uh, and she won't be able to have a kid. Right, exactly. So the world will end actually right. If, right. if you if right. you permitted that to happen. Right. So, so stepping back to the mosquitoes now, we have this technique. We know it works. We know it works quite well, quite efficiently. You can do it. It's been figured that if you put about five percent of the of the population start out with about five percent of the population, it'll sweep through a population in a relatively few generations. Mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. But wouldn't the same so, rule apply for humans? Probably. Uh, relative, the yeah. generations are longer, right. but it's and not. It's, you know. And it's harder to do. On. Yeah. But this means, in essence, you can make up a few billion of these mosquitoes. That really wouldn't be that hard to do in this day and age. Yeah. You know, carry your buckets of them down to the tropical countries where you, you got this problem, leave these buckets out, and all these female sterile mosquitoes start popping out all of these mosquitoes are spreading this female sterility gene throughout the population, and they've calculated that probably in about three to four years, there will be no more Anopheles gambi mosquitoes around in the world. Or any kind of mosquitoes well, that, you, that you do this for. Well, you're doing it always within a species. I mean, the, the yeah, okay, species... but Egypti would be the same. You, 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 you could do is you, the one that's doing you, Zika. You could do a, a version of it, presumably, on Aedes aegypti, yeah, right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, so this is where, okay, so we got the, you know, you've eradicated things. And we, we have actually eradicated, I say, life forms. You remember we had a show about viruses a while ago, and we basically have eradicated smallpox off the face of the planet. I mean, there are a few little stores of it kept around for research. It, it won't, I mean, unless, unless one of those stores gets broken into and oh, spread. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah, okay. Right. Nobody is but, walking but, around with the active disease. Right, and, and it's never going to come back, you know. We, and no one really cares. You heard it here on Think Tech, yeah. But that was a virus, and the virus is sort of a, at a special place between non-living and living, you know. We have not, and we have now wiped out some species uh, accidentally and on purpose and seen some in interesting impacts, but now we have a tool where we can very purposely choose to literally wipe out a species. We could decide, we want to rid the world of malaria, and therefore we're going to rid it of the Anopheles mosquito. And we could probably go out and do that in two or three, four years. Are they doing it now? No. They're, they're still in a laboratory. Well, the problem, yes, because the problem is, once, once you do this, once you start sort of letting those buckets of mosquitoes out, you can't call them all back. You can't sort of whistle and, oh, come on back, guys. We didn't mean to do this. And so you say, what's the matter? So a bunch of a species of mosquito goes dead. Who cares, right? 
But why can't I reverse the whole thing in the same way? Why can't I do that? You, in theory, could then take a, a new bucket. A new bucket of and these, these, been, these, these mosquitoes, mosquitoes and have been doctored get with a, some sort of override switch on for the female sterility gene. And yeah, this this is how uh, Superman saved right. the planet. <laughs> <laughs> in theory, you you could do that, but um, the the question really then becomes sort of an, it, it verges after you've driven you know should we drive a species to extinction on purpose? Is that is that a legitimate sort of thing to do. I mean, yes, we would rid the world of malaria, which is great, you know, that would end a lot of human suffering, infant mortality, blah, blah, blah. And who cares? So one species of mosquito is gone, or two or three or four, if you really want to get technical about it. If you really want to get rid of all of malaria, you can have to knock out several species of mosquitoes. Should, should you care about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, there's a balance. I mean, for some people it's a balance. I don't make a judgment on it, but some people. I mean, for example, they already did this in Brazil, right? They took buckets down there, and they're looking for that uh, Egypt, Egypt mosquitoes, and they're going to try to kill them all. Well, and, uh, they're not concerned about the ethical issue you raised. Like they did it th already. Th they've done related techniques where you release a bunch of sterile males, for instance, and flood the population with sterile males yeah. in, in an area. It's not and, the same and, thing. And no, no. Oh. It isn't. That will knock out local population pretty well, but it really won't have the effect of this. This will go through and spread through your population until every last individual basically has it. And in this case... And that's because it hits both sides, it, both it, sexes. It, so right, again, every individual who passes it on passes on multiple copies of so it. And no, nothing. No, no escaping it. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Okay. And the, the problem is, of course, that mosquitoes don't, don't exist in a vacuum, right? They live, they are part of an ecosystem, right? When they are larvae, there's lots of little fish that eat them. And suddenly there's going to be no more mosquito larvae. Now, what are those little fish going to eat? And, well, maybe, and there's maybe bats. Maybe the fish would change to another, uh, another little another type of bug, mosquito bug larvae. larvae. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's bats and birds that, that eat flying mosquitoes. And again, their, their food source has now been sucked away and gone. What are they going to eat? And, you say, and then, you know, something on top of the chain well, yeah, you begin, keep on going You up. begin to wonder, right, do we, do we really want to start that kind of experiment? Uh, I mean, we're already, God knows, doing enough of this stuff in the world, doing these experiments that we have no real control over, no real knowledge what the outcome is going to be. What about, what about the uh, knowledge about the outcome? You know, right now there's a bunch of people uh, at, at UH and elsewhere around the world trying to figure out the relationships geologically mm -hmm. of all the things that happen around climate change and weather and all mm -hmm. that. And they're, they're really making great progress because they're figuring out the relationships. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there are people out there trying to figure out the relationships of mosquitoes and other things on the chain, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can do that, can't we? We can figure out the relationships of every type of organism to every other type well, of organism. The, the, the ties are many and varied, you know? Uh, I mean, you realize, for example, that, that you have uh, about 10 times as many cells in you and on you that aren't your own cells as you do of your own cells. I feel I mean, they're my friends. You, you, are, you are a huge ecosystem yourself. It's the lanternfish and, and the whale. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, those cells w within you are themselves sort of ecosystems. I mean, yeah. the, the relationships are really it, yeah, immensely yeah. complicated. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, the mosquitoes disappear and nobody really cares, and the small fish that feed on the mosquito larvae disappear and nobody cares, and the larger fish that feed on the small you're fish we then... Never really, never really get to the bottom of it. We never really know for sure. You don't know where it's going to stop, really, yeah, you know? Yeah. Plus, what happens if, as sometimes does, you get uh, so-called horizontal gene transfer, where things move from one species into another species, and suddenly now it's not the mosquitoes who have the female sterility gene, but Let's say it moves in your honeybees. You mean this could happen? Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you take the step, use yeah. the CRISPR technology on the mosquitoes, right. and then you find yeah. that something in the mosquito got into the honeybee. Right. And the Oops. honeybees had the same effect. Right. And suddenly it's going through the honeybee population, and your honeybee population goes boom. And then, and then no then, more honey. Yeah. Well, then no more food. I mean, so much of our the honeybees pollinate all the plants that we depend on for our food. Yeah. And yeah, that we would suddenly. But when I when I hear you know we know we have made certain organisms extinct right. on this planet. It's already yeah. happened. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they're never going to participate in you know in, right. this, in this you know interconnection right. you talk about. Good, they're gone. Right. And it hasn't had a big effect. On right. Us. But I, what I hear you saying is that the little guys could have a sort of telescope bigger effect because of all the things on. There are more things on the food chain above them that we don't know maybe. 
So we have to be very careful with little things like mosquitoes because they could affect a, a telescoping number of big things. Well, th that is certainly true. It, it works both ways. But for one, the fabric of life is a very rich interwoven fabric. And you can pull... Only if you behave yourself. And you, you can pull one thread out of it without really disrupting the integrity. And, and that's, that's what we've been doing, you know, passenger pigeons, which, you know, you realize that, you know, a century ago, well, a century and a half ago, passenger pigeons existed in numbers where individual flocks of them would literally darken the sky for hours over places. Individual flocks. These birds existed in the tens of billions. And then 40 years later, they were gone from what the planet. Happened? They, they, they didn't adapt well to people. <laughs> when, when we started building cities, that confused the hell out of them. They, they would, these flocks would come, and we'd build a skyscraper, and these flocks would, would just, yeah. just pile up against them. Yeah. We went out, and we needed cheap food, and so and they would all roost all together in big trees, and you just build up nice dry wood around all the bases of these trees, wait till they're all roosting at night, torch it, <laughs> and a whole bunch of fresh squab. You know? and we, did, we did everything we could, and we, we, we knocked passenger pigeons out of the world very fast. Okay, but, but they're, they're still relatively high up on the chain, right. though. So Yellowstone is an, is an interesting place, because they... Uh, Yellowstone for, Park. For, yeah, Yellowstone Park, because for years there were no wolves in Yellowstone, right? And it existed in, in that state, and the scientists had studied it and knew it. And then, if you recall, some years ago, they reintroduced some wolves to Yellowstone over some considerable protest. And... What did they introduce? Wolves. Oh, wolves, yeah. The top dominant predator that used, yeah. that used to roam there. Yeah. And the course of the Yellowstone River has actually changed after the reintroduction of the wolf. How can a wolf change the course <laughs> of a river? Because it, the brush was being eaten by the lar relatively large population of the deer and elk that were there. And once the wolves were in there and keeping the population of the deer and elk down, then the brush could grow certainly better in some places and along the riverbanks more closely and change the course of the river. So it's Collecting not, the soil. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's not necessarily just a bottom-up or a top-down thing. You know, all the threads are important. Yeah. Uh, all the, all what, the directions, all the What I worry about is when you've, we've made a technology like this that really is uh, sort of cookbooky now, you know, step A, step B, step C, you get it right out of the oven, you know? That makes it so easy for us to be in, like pull threads out of nature right and left. And, you know, as I said, you know, you pull a thread out of a well-woven fabric, nothing much happens. You pull two or three threads out, nothing much happens. Yeah. You start pulling a hundred threads out and your piece of fabric is liable to start fraying, right? Yeah. So, but if you're attacking mosquitoes, you know, you and I talked about this. There's a new technology which lets you, doesn't change. Right, the RNA interference. Right, right. right. you knew what I, you read my mind. <laughs> RNA interference, so you can, you can make it change like for one day. Right. Or for two, or for right. a week, or two. Right. And so you can affect X number of generations, and therefore skinny the population down, but not destroy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it'd take another leg of science on this, right. another step. But we could use this technology sort of in a temporary way mm -hmm. and not destroy, you know, uh, the whole species. Right. W w isn't that a solution? Yes, in a sense. Don't you uh, have confidence in <laughs> mankind not to abuse this technology? Huh. No. <laughs> <laughs> have we ever seen cases where technology was abused? <laughs> let, let us count the ways, you know. Uh, th no, that's what I say. This, this really fundamentally gets us down to a really serious ethical question here. You know, we have this tool at hand that we can use to drive species that we don't like to extinction pretty reliably. Should we use it, you know? What's going to happen no, if you use it? Murderous. You know, you know, it could be murderous. Right, it could, it could be great. Yeah. You know, everyone who gets malaria, they're going to they're, they're raise their hand and vote to use it, you know, if they're in danger of having let, malaria. Let me, let me look at the flip side of it with you, though. Just the same way you could use your micro needle mm -hmm. and pull it out and put kind of some kind of super characteristic in there. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the boys of Brazil, Gregory Peck. All right. It was right. a very provocative movie. Right. You know, where you create um, delayed generations of people with the same DNA as Hitler. Right. <laughs> it was. Right. It was ridiculous. Right. Um, and, and this happened in Brazil. Funny we right. should have it happen in Brazil. <laughs> there, there it is right. again. But I mean, you could use this for positive effect too. Right. You, you, uh, you, you could, could change human race. You could make everybody a Superman going forward. You, Same you, way. You, you could, in theory, take and and if you found some gene that improved fitness in some way and guaranteed that all of us would have you know 20/20 vision and perfect hearing throughout our lives and all this kind of stuff, that would be good. You know, 
still, even then, it could be used for bad purposes. Yes, you, you could make a generation or a, a, a race of Hitlers. Yeah, and <laughs> and plus you have to you have to worry. The world doesn't stay constant. Things change all the time. So what seems really good to us today might 100 years from now be a less than desirable trait. And then it's too late. Yeah. Uh, if, if everyone has it now, and there's no variation. So, wow, well, I'm, I'm, now I'm troubled. Because, you know, I, I'd like it to be a balancing act. For example, <laughs> you know, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about, uh, you know, what do we do in the big island uh, over Zika? We find mosquitoes. Um, and we, you know, we can use the conventional methods, but they'll be back, mm -hmm. and Zika will be back. And so, how do we make a permanent solution? This sounds very <laughs> World War II, <laughs> a permanent right. solution on, on the Zika mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> this technique could be used. So then you have to ba ethically, you right. have to balance between, you know, saving the world from Zika or right. saving the Big Island from Zika. Yeah. Uh, you know, or destroying the mosquito population, whatever right. that brings. And, and actually, you know, islands are very interesting places to do this in because we have in, the, in Hawaii a, a perfect sort of testing ground, right? It's a small group of islands quite isolated from anywhere else. And if you tried this technology on a mosquito population on Lanai or Molokai or the Big Island yeah. and wipe them out 100% there, yeah, you can always reimport the mosquitoes if you found for some reason having no mosquitoes really was bad for the thing. Right. You can bring mosquitoes in from somewhere right. else. Whoops, you changed that yeah, mind. You know, and, and, I can see the ad in Craig's. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but those, in that case, I mean, it would spread just through an island and then basically it would die out. Yeah. And so it would be an experimental yeah, area. Yeah, and so I would not be terribly surprised, let's say, to find out that, that Hawaii gets used either on purpose or accidentally as a as a test ground for some of this kind of technology. Yeah, but then we can find we can find that we want to bring them in again and maybe that creates a second problem because now yeah. you're bringing in a characteristic that doesn't exist and maybe you don't know exactly what the effect of that is and then you you know you have all the relationship thing. Let's take a break. My head is hurting. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ethan Allen. Uh, we're at Likeable Science. Indeed, this is Likeable and Scary. And we're calling this, uh, what, Extinction? Wait. Eradication, Extinction, and Ethics. Yeah. That's we're talking about all of these things. We'll be right back. We'll <laughs> talk about and what you tell the scientists to do. Whoa. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm I.C. Davidson. Thanks for tuning in to Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, one of the things that we do here, or the thing that we do here, is promote civic engagement in Hawaii. What does that mean? We want to talk about things that people want to hear about. And we want you to engage us and be part of that conversation. One of the ways that you can do that is by joining in during our live show via Twitter. How do you do that? When well, you get on the interwebs and get Twitter, get an account and mention us if you have a question. What you'll do is you tune into our show live, tweet us questions, and we'll, our hosts and guests will address them accordingly. It's really easy, it's really fun, and I think that your participation in what we're doing here will help us continue the dialogue on very important issues that we're trying to cover. Sustainability, clean energy, you name it, we're on top of it. We want you to be part of what we're doing because together we'll be able to make things change. Thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii, thinktechhawaii.com, weekdays 12 to 5 p.m. Okay, oh wow, we're back. We got new ideas and thoughts. <laughs> you know, too bad you weren't there for the break. You know, Ethan is on a roll. <laughs> okay, so the last thing you talked about was Palmyra Island and the rat population, of sure. and they needed to get rid of the rats, and they did. They got rid of 100% of them. How did they do that? So this Again, it's an island. So, like Hawaii. Right, this was, this was an, uh, an earlier guest here on Likeable Science of Mine, and a, a wonderful guy who works for a great group called Island Conservation, and they try to get rid of invas invasive species off of islands, figuring that invasive species are typically particularly bad for islands. So rats have been introduced to all the Palmyra Atoll during World War II, probably, if not before, and had by, spread by, over by all... The ships, by the ships right, that came by, yeah. Uh, had spread over all 25 islands that make up that atoll. Yeah. So this guy looked and looked at the types of poisons you might use on rats, the types of traps you might use. The rats apparently, apparently knew to avoid the traps there. They would not go for any of the traps that they could find. He looked at various types of poison that would hurt rats but wouldn't hurt other things there. Wouldn't hurt the birds, wouldn't hurt the, the uh, hermit crabs, you know, wouldn't hurt the fish. Finally settled on one particular kind of poison. Looked at the schedule of when animals are around, when best time is going to be when the birds are 
out at sea and no young birds are around. You, know, you had to play all these factors that he did, and he very carefully figured out how, and then how much can you realistically expect to get with one application of this poison if you put it around literally so that you know you've got a pellet of it every square meter of land you know, in this, on these islands. And how long do you then wait for your, and then do a second application so those few somehow who got, who got by that first batch are definitely going to be hit by the second batch. And he basically waited. Systematic. Yeah, he planned everything out and then did but, two, but two with applications. Yeah, with conventional Yeah, with, with poison. <clears throat> he didn't do any GMOs. No, no, no. Like and now, sure enough, the, the plant life in the, in the atolls is all changing because the, the things that, that rats are eating are, are not being eaten anymore and they're coming back, you know. Well, I, I, I want to tell you a short right. story, and then, then we can focus on this, this question about what do you tell the scientists. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, on, on Israeli television a few days ago, I just love this story. I tell it to everybody. <laughs> it was a story about um, some biochemists in Israel, and they were charged with finding a way to stop those Arab kids from throwing stones at the Israeli soldiers because they do it all the time. And they would, you know, gather up and uh, be on the other side of the fence or down the street, but they would throw stones and the Israeli soldiers would get hurt and they didn't want to shoot back. So, it, you know, it's a regular problem. So how can we stop this without hurting anybody? We're going to stop this without hurting anybody. So they developed a compound, which was a sort of a cross between skunk mix and the smell of human feces. Okay, they put it together and then they shot it out in these, these foam, uh, rather uh, spray water, water guns, you know, not, not cannons, but water guns. Mm -hmm. And it would go, you know, over the air and come down the other side of the fence and everybody would get it. And they couldn't stand each other. <laughs> they couldn't stand being in a group of people who smelled like they did. <laughs> and time after time, the crowd would disperse immediately. And of course, it lasted for like a month. You couldn't get right. it off. <laughs> you know, skunk, right, I mean, right, it's terrible. Right. <laughs> Works like a charm. Yeah. Now that's classy. Right. I mean, this is, I mean, very smart right. guys, very creative guys, trying to figure out how to disperse the crowd, right. cool off the situation, right. don't hurt anybody, and they did heard, it. Yeah, heard another one, actually, for, uh, again, from somewhere in the Middle East, and they were getting, these riots would, would form, crowds would gather in the day and get themselves worked up, and as the evening would come along, they'd, they'd you know, begin to cause trouble and all this, and some really bright guy basically looked at it and said, Keep all the food trucks away. Don't let the food trucks in. And sure enough, you know, the crowds would sort of be there during the day, but like, ah, at night, hey, I'm yeah, hungry. I'm going to go yeah, home and eat, home. you know? It's the end of that. <laughs> and, and the crowds would disperse. And there was yeah, no, yeah, un understand, yeah, yeah. Understanding human behavior is, a very, is very critical to, to that kind of uh, work, you know? So, you know, not that we can, you know, legislate here, you and me today, but it seems oh, why like. Not? <laughs> oh, why not? Yeah. <laughs> seems to me that, um, you know, the answer is somewhere in the middle is yes we can destroy the mosquito population mm -hmm. that that may not be a good idea we're not sure mm -hmm. we worry uh or we can leave them alone do nothing and then we'll have a lot of zika and other and malaria mm -hmm. and whatnot there must be a middle ground mm -hmm. and the middle ground maybe is to make them nice you know it's the it's the nice gene mm -hmm. we are going to plant the nice gene the nice gene means something like don't bite human people. There, there we go. That right. would be good. If, if, <laughs> that's actually a very creative solution. If you could make the mosquitoes, make female mosquitoes, insensitive to the human smell or repelled by, better yet, repelled by human scent, they wouldn't bite us anymore. Then they would just go around and bite the little, little bite squirrels and else. chipmunks and birds. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but then if the chipmunk bit you, maybe you have a problem. <laughs> Probably not, though. But it doesn't work that way. So it seems to me that there's probably a middle ground somewhere. Right. And who knows? I mean, this, that's a gross solution mm -hmm. because how do you get them to stop biting one species as against another? I mean, there's right. a lot of mammal species around. Right. Right. How do you get them to and again, you're making a difference? Some yeah. Pretty large-scale ethical decisions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, if you find right. something creative like that, like the, like the water spray, right? right? Like the skunk <laughs> right. business, um, then you could you could leave them leave them to survive, right? Uh, not not make them extinct right. and have a maybe it would have some effect, uh, you know, in the world if they couldn't bite people, right? But probably not much of an effect, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, except that we'd be safer, um, and everybody would feel better about things, right? Yeah. So if I if I was going to be the uh, the king of the world, mm -hmm. and if I could instruct scientists with some reasonable confidence, they would listen to me. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough I, one. <laughs> I would tell them that's what to do. That's what you should work on now. Yeah. 
Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it is hard, you know, you, you get a technology like this and then, then it gets refined and improved. And, and this really actually came from several different lines of development in science as so much now does. Uh, and you never quite know where it's going to go. I mean, that's part of the, sure. the, the joy and delight of doing science is you really don't quite know what's well, going to come out. Joy and tonight for, uh, delight, but it's a real risk. Right. Because not every scientist uh, would agree that there's an right. ethical question. Right. Some of them would say, let's just do it, man. You know, we're not going to worry about yeah. ethics. Uh, I mean, you know, some, somebody had to make the decision to uh, do the, you know, drop the first atomic bomb. And that, you know, that was well, a, a very serious, uh, decision, a very yeah. serious question about, you know, you're, you're going to kill a whole lot of people here. Yeah, and on that uh, slight digression, I've been reading a book by, name, uh, by uh, the guy's name is, um, oh, gee, uh, Winchester, Simon Winchester, who was at the East West Center for a long time. He wrote a book recently called Pacific. Mm -hmm. First chapter of the book is about Bikini Island, mm -hmm. and it's about how the Americans in the Cold War in the early 1950s you know, we're blowing up atomic bombs right. above ground and also in the ocean mm -hmm. around Bikini Island. And what they did, what we did, oh. was really unforgivable, how we wrecked the environment we, there. We, as I understand it, purposely set off explosions knowing that a cloud of radioactive dust, smoke, debris was, was going to likely to blow over a population center just to see sort of right. what's that going to do. Right. And we already knew it was going to hurt people and yeah. kill them. All right. Uh, I mean, it was, and we, we blew up in the early 50s, we blew a hydrogen bomb up there, which was much we, worse, we, and it hurt some of our own people. Uh, no, no, no we, did, we did 67 tests out, out in the Marshall Islands, 67 yeah. thermonuclear blasts. Still having an effect today. Oh, yeah, yeah, you still, no one lives on the bikini. The half-life is 5,000 years. Yeah, 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 yeah no, so. no, no one lives on, but they actually did try to let people go back and live on Didn't bikini work. for a while, and then, then they, they realized sick. that they, pretty soon they were you know, building up high yeah. levels of... But the point, the point is that the guys who were running this, of course, they were Army uh, high-ranking right. officers. I mean, let's, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, they looked at it from a scientific point of view and also a Cold War point of view. We need this technology. Mm -hmm. We decide this question in favor of the technology, mm -hmm. of the weapon, of the destructive mm -hmm. capability of the weapon. Yeah. And, and uh, that's not a good ethical decision. Well, I mean, it, you know, it sort, sort of is a classic, you know, Pandora's box or genie out of the bottle kind of thing. Once, once some of these new things happen, you, you can't sort of stuff them back in the box and hide them. I mean, people talk about GMOs. Let's ban all the GMOs. Hey, folks, it's not going to happen, you know. <laughs> GMOs are already out there. Already out there. You know, they're going to, that technology is well established. It's going to be used. It's going to spread around. Yeah, you might want to regulate it here and there and try to do what you can, but, but you know, you're not, you're not putting that, you're not making it going to go away. It's just not going to happen. Well, now we get to the last question about actual prediction. Okay. Forget about if you were a king or I were a king or anything. What's really going to happen with this technology? What, what do you see? I mean, either in terms of, of being confident of the human race or maybe not so confident. Uh, I suspect it's going to find some really wonderful medical uses quite quickly. Uh, I suspect people will, will figure out ways to use it to fight cancer, where essentially you'll, you'll get uh, you'll immunology. See, you'll see, for instance, make my, make my cells immune right, or fight cancer, right, and then a ripple effect right through my whole body immediately. Yeah, you'll you'll see you'll do amniotic testing or whatever, realize that your child is prone to whatever, and be able essentially to to bump something into them and, and start essentially working on the defense right away before they ever get the disease. And wow. yeah, I, I suspect that kind of thing is gonna is gonna be some of the early, because that's, yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, after that, it's a little harder to say, you know, yeah. Um, it's a new world out there. Yeah, yeah. Ethan, have you identified, you know, the risks, the possibilities, the whole scope of this thing, and it seems to me we're in a new world. We don't realize, we don't see it that way, but that's the way it is. Yeah, and I mean, because it is such a simple sort of cookbook technology, it means... Everyone can do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So while you and I might decide, no, it's not ethical to wipe out this, that, or the other species. Doesn't mean the guy down the block who doesn't like that species is, is going to make that same decision, and, and pretty soon he's going to have the tools in hand to do it. Another divine test of the quality of humanity. Yeah. We have so many. <laughs> yes, Thank you for helping me explore oh. them. Oh, I, that's right. yeah, I, always enjoy, I always enjoy our conversations here. It's, it's always great to come in. Yeah. We'll do it again. Yeah. Excellent. I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you.